bushes alive, no trees alive in this entire area. There was a maple tree that had a, um, multiple trunks, and half the maple tree was in full bloom, and the side that would have been exposed to the object that Janine stated she saw was dead, and nothing was growing on that tree. I personally was puzzled then, and am still puzzled as to what might have caused that. As to what Janine saw, I have no idea. Uh, but something caused this area of 60 feet wide by 90 feet long to be completely void of any living vegetation for a several year period of time. I made periodic trips back to the area over the next few years, and uh, each time that I went, it was as before, nothing living in that particular area. Everything else around there uh, was green and lush in the summertime and bare in the wintertime as it should be. I believed Janine, and I'll state today, I certainly believe that uh, she saw exactly what she stated she saw. Now, what it was, we don't know. Perhaps the most significant detail of the five sightings is the way the community responds to seeing UFOs. While amazed at the spectacular sightings in their area, the locals don't have a problem with being at the hub of UFO activity. Most UFO researchers consider the existence of UFOs a challenge to organized religion. The local pastors would disagree. Well, of course, being a Christian, um, I think it all has to start from, from, from a basis. Being a Christian entails uh, taking uh, by faith something that you cannot actually see. The Bible, for instance. Now, there's a certain amount of, uh, of uh, things that you can read in there that can be proven, of course, uh, you know, by history and archaeology and so forth. But no way could a person come to the point of being a Christian just on the basis of what has been proven or has not been proven in the Bible. So the element of faith is there, and you've got to, you've got to start there. So the reason I'm saying that is that for me as a Christian, I can see to where in the Bible Belt you have this underlying root system of, of faith in the Bible and in God, let's put it that way, so that you don't have to feel like you have to explain everything. Whereas if you're not in the... Uh, if you're not in the area, the Bible Belt, or you haven't been, you haven't had that traditional, um, those values of faith instilled in you, well, then you're going to feel like you have to prove. Hmm. Th more things have to be proven to you, factual, rather than taking them by faith. That's why I think that you'll find in the Bible Belt less of an apprehension concerning UFOs. I feel that Jesus... In, in the scripture, and I believe it was in the Gospel of John, said that there were others uh, that uh, those that he talked to at that time did not know about, other sheep. And I feel that they could have been uh, people from other planets, uh, other places, not just uh, necessarily limited to this world. But uh, I think if you want a biblical text proof to say that there is a possibility within Christianity that Jesus allowed the the possibility of other life that that would be it uh, that to some people might not be enough but it it is for me because I just about base everything that I believe on on uh, the word of God and and he gives me that leeway right there to think about the, about the possibility of other life for me to say that uh, to teach people here that I figured God out there are no such things as uh, UFOs or, or whatever you want to call them, you know, that's taken, that's taken license a little too far. Because if I believe that the Bible says that God, the handiwork declares uh, the majesty of God, well then there's no limit to, to what he can or cannot do. And uh, if I understand my position as a believer, then I have to respect a certain amount of the unknown. You've heard the term Southern Hospitality. Sand Mountain is the epitome of Southern Hospitality. People up here trust each other. Uh, a lot of the things that they do are done by handshake rather than by contract. 
Um, and they trusted the outsiders, too, until the inside edition piece. We sent Jeff Cole down there to see if E.T. has a southern accent. They came from outer space. I still believe I saw a UFO. Police were helpless. There's nothing that I've ever seen before in my life. And the town of Fife, Alabama, was stunned by the strange visitors. My dog saw it, but he won't talk about it. He went crawl on the floor, and I know that's what's happened, because he, he talks to anybody. <laughs> Fife Police Chief Junior Garmini and Assistant Chief Fred Works got the call and went out to investigate what they figured was some, well, monkey business. Whatever it was they saw, it will be a long time before Fife forgets the things from out of this world. There's some people that's going to ridicule us for it, some people disbelieve it. But I hope them people themselves get to view it one of these days. They may be coming to see you next. There is a legitimate investigation going on down there, if you can believe it. The FAA and the Air Force are doing that investigation. And if any of you Martians are watching this broadcast, please drop by to see us and bring Elvis with you. Straight ahead. We'll get back to reality. What was their reaction to the job they did? Well, they did a job, all right. Uh, they spoofed the incident. They made it to appear like a Keystone Cops kind of uh, a program, and uh, people up here didn't like it at all. Uh, they thought they were here in good faith, so they showed them the, the Southern hospitality. And when the program came out, they were incensed, not just the people in the FAF, but the people of the whole area were very, very angry at what Inside Edition did. Uh, it was ridiculous. Uh, when Inside Edition came in to do their piece, everybody was welcome. Uh, we made them, tried to make them feel at home and uh, uh, be a part of the community. But after the Inside Edition uh, piece ran on TV, the, the outlook toward the media was completely different. Uh, it, it wasn't hostile, it's just that they didn't get any help. Uh, help was slow in coming. You had to uh, uh, show good faith that what you were doing wasn't going to be like what Inside Edition did. People are still seeing things up here. Uh, they're not as frequent as they were during that time, but there are reports of uh, seeing things in the sky uh, almost constantly. Uh, I don't mean every day, but I mean Hardly a week goes by and what we don't get some reports of something in the air. The history of UFOs in America goes back to 1897 when a great airship was seen traveling coast to coast by multiple witnesses. This despite the fact that airships did not yet exist. Reports of the great airship were printed in newspapers from New York to California. More recently, the modern age of UFOs in the United States was ushered in by the Army Air Force's Air Technical Intelligence Center. Among the first Air Force officers to analyze reports of UFOs was Wendell Stevens, a retired lieutenant colonel now living in Tucson, Arizona. Colonel Stevens left the Air Force after 26 years to investigate UFOs full-time around the world. I was working in the Foreign Technology Division at Wright Field. I was a test pilot there and all of the pilots had a desk. They had additional assignments besides their flying assignment. Mine was in the Foreign Technology Division in the Air Intelligence section, Air Technical Intelligence. It's where we analyzed uh, technical data pertaining to uh, engineering developments concerning aircraft discovered worldwide. It was forwarded through intelligence agencies to the United States government, and we got the aero-technical information and we tried to match it with other information from other sources, from other countries, trying to stay on top of the latest developments worldwide. And of course, at the same time, we were getting operational reports on strange aerial phenomena observed. Uh, during the war, this, this phenomena was called Foo Fighters. It comes from the French word for fire, few, few fi fireball fighters. And, uh, all of those things were collectively called few fighters, for lack of a better term, 
And we had reports from back as early as 1933 on such uh, events observed and reported through intelligence channels. These few fighters represented the ultimate development at the time. It was something beyond the visible capability of any country in the world to produce, as far as I could tell, from what was available to me, probably as much as anybody else in the country at the time. And my assignment took, to, took me to Anchorage, Alaska, where I went to an Army base. Uh, the Air Force had separated from the Army, and now I'm going back to an Army base. And I found that my position, initial position there, was as assistant base operations officer, which was out of my specialty. But my primary duty was to supervise a team of technical technicians from the Air Material Command, from my parent command, who was up there uh, working a, a highly classified rider project on an unclassified weather research project. The weather research project was using the B-29s to survey the Arctic, and that was an excuse for the B-29s to go into the Arctic space and run what they called profile missions with their mission folders on potential targets. They were assigned a grid plan to be flown after that to map both uh, photo, photo mapping, uh, radiation mapping, thermal mapping, uh, magnetic mapping, we ran all kinds of maps simultaneously with equipment installed to be aboard the B-29s when they were prepared for these missions. Along with that was this special team that I was supervising of civilians that installed a, a kit of equipment aboard the airplanes which consisted of additional cameras. It consisted of all uh, combat airplanes have 16 millimeter cameras mounted in the guns. But in addition to those cameras, we installed other free-mounted 16-millimeter cameras, handheld 16-millimeter cameras, 35-millimeter movie cameras, a 70-millimeter movie camera, and we had still cameras up to an, a Fairchild K20 that took a picture on an 8-inch by 10-inch negative. That's the size of a typewriter page. These cameras were all put aboard the craft, and each crew member was assigned specific responsibilities with each camera, in case something happened in the air, they were prepared. Uh, we also installed surge detectors on all of the electrical systems in the airplane. We had radio frequency detectors that swept the spectrum of radio frequencies. Uh, they would search the spectrum for an emission, stop on emission, read it for 30 seconds, and cancel it, and then sweep again looking for more until they had copied all of the frequencies being emitted. It would continually scan. Now, when those airplanes returned from a combat mission, all of this equipment was downloaded and in the debriefing of the crew if they had encountered any, anything or if they discovered surges on the line or electrical anom anomalies or interference on the radio or anything unusual, we'd package all of the material in, into a metal box and it would be couriered to Washington, chained to an officer's wrist that night. And about twice a month, they came back with reports of something operational in the field of activity we were surveying. We, they either saw other aircraft in flight over the Arctic under conditions that would indicate strange aircraft, high speeds, far beyond anything we could fly, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 miles an hour, objects standing still in the air, motionless, objects approaching the, the aircraft head-on, reversing direction and then proceeding ahead of the aircraft at the same speed in flight. We had reports of disc-shaped objects that paralleled the craft in flight. In one case, we had one that paralleled the ship so close it was behind the trailing edge of the leading wing and ahead of the leading edge of the tail wing in the slot there. And they got pictures of it with all the cameras and with the Fairchild K-10 camera too. And we had reports of objects that were seen to land on the ice, on the snow and the ice at the ice cap of the Arctic, we had reports of them landing on the water. We had a report of them submerging and disappearing. We had another report of one rising to the surface, being seen to come to the surface, leave the water, hover momentarily, and then take off at high speed and fly away. All of this was clearly beyond the capability of any of the aircraft that we had studied worldwide in the Air Technical Intelligence Center. And, of course, they were very concerned about who might have experienced such a breakthrough without prior knowledge through intelligence sources and they to me again they represented the supreme development in aircraft and that's what piqued my curiosity 
I argued that they had to be extraterrestrial vehicles, but I, I was I was a major at the time, and.